What's up, guys? Welcome to Asylum Runs Podcast, and yeah, I haven't done an episode in about like three weeks. I uploaded the Lyoto Machida breakdown, if you guys haven't seen that. I worked really hard on that. It took me quite a few weeks to get it done, even though it was only a couple minutes. Uh, the actual thing is a multiple part series. I, I said one out of six, but uh, it's going to be, I believe, like one out of 12 because there's six offensive strategies and there's going to be another, I believe, six defensive strategies. So there's going to be a long term breakdown deal type thing going on. It's going to be a long series. And it, um, yeah, so if you guys, if you guys haven't watched it or anything, please go and watch that because uh, I worked hard on that one. And uh, it sucks because it doesn't have a lot of views. Um, probably wasn't even that good, but it's my first time ever making a video, and I'm pretty proud of myself for that because I had zero editing ability. I had zero knowledge of uh, of editing videos. Besides, when I do my podcast, which is just straight audio, do a little tweaking on the audio editing, and then post a picture, and that's it. Um. But yeah, so yeah, today we're going to talk about intrinsic motivational training. And what do I mean by that? Um, what do I mean by that? Um, when we train, usually when we're training, a lot of time we're at a gym, right? Especially when we, we talk about MMA training and jujitsu training, wrestling. Um, kickboxing, whatever, whatever floats your boat, whatever martial art you do, usually it's at a gym, right? It's usually at a dojo, a gym, somewhere where you have to do some sort of sparring, especially in uh, the modern martial arts. We like to do a lot of sparring or drilling with an opponent because, you know, everyone says that's the most realistic way to practice is, uh, especially for grappling, you know, you have to have a partner and drill with them, but To me, there's something that, and guys, I'm really turning myself into a karate guy here, and as you can see, that's why I broke down Lyoto Machida's um, video. Um, Sorry, just, that's why I made the video, breaking down Lyoto Machida, was because uh, I'm trying to break down these karate principles more, and I'm learning karate more, which is very fascinating because I have a background in MMA, right, and in jiu-jitsu. And in Muay Thai, and boxing, wrestling, I don't have a traditional martial art background, and I'm getting more into traditional martial arts, and I'm doing Japanese goju, which is very interesting because it's a it's a mix between Okinawan style goju, and then they shotokan it, making it more Japanese, and that's a whole nother topic for another day and if you understand karate you would understand what i mean by by that so whatever um it's not about me uh yeah so one thing that traditional martial arts do especially uh let's say like karate right i'm gonna gonna use karate example because i'm not a kung fu expert i i don't know any Kung Fu, I don't really, besides a little bit of Wing Chun (laughs) as a teenager just messing around, but besides that, I don't really know anything. Um, And one thing in karate that to me is really big is the intrinsic motivational training. And that is training done solely for your internal motivations. To only see what you do and only you. And you're only competing with yourself. And you're only self-improving. There's no aspect of an opponent. Even though you kind of do visualize an opponent most of the time. But for the most part you're perfecting your technique. You're you're perfecting your movement. And you have to see where your holes are. And you have to really... Focus on every little aspect of your body. And what I mean is maybe doing your keyhones, which is like your basics that you do, which is like just punching in a stance or just in a neutral position and blocking and kicking. 
and your katas, and it could be like a basic t- kata, like a taikyoko or gekisai or sanshin or whatever kata it is. It could be more advanced kata. Or, and by doing these katas and just, you know, people people are cynical about katas. There's a, there's a thing, especially in MMA, and, and when I talk to you guys, I'm talking to you guys in a strictly MMA context mainly you know like i see myself first and foremost as an mma coach and a an mma uh competitor i guess you can say an mma analysis uh an mma student to me i fell in love with mma i i saw the first couple ufcs as a child and i uh got into martial arts and i got into mma so for me it is all context mma and you would think what the hell what is the purpose of kata? Like, why would I even do that? And why would I need intrinsic motivational training? I can just go and do a hard workout and throw up. And that would be really hard on me mentally. Right? So, so why would I need to do kata? Why would I need to do ki- your kihon or punch from the hip? Like, it just makes no sense uh, the way we see things now, the way we train now. But I don't think... I think it's it's not a good way to think about it. And I think the reason why is because if you can if you can fix all the holes, just tape up all the holes that you have in your mental training and being able to transfer that into your physical training and there's no crazy blind spots in your physical movements. Then when there's an opponent in front of you, you are armored with this natural, perfected movement. And this doesn't always transfer because if you don't do the transferring process of what you learned in kata and then trying to dissect it into actual combative stuff in the ring for MMA, um, and it might not look how you think. It's actually... It's an interesting experiment and another topic, but if you can do that whole process of getting the perfection in your kata, the perfection in your basics, and then putting that into then your shadow boxing and into drills of adding these principles and movements and adding that that perfection of movements into now your combative movements, way you're more I guess, more combative, yeah, combative movements into, you know, your jabs and your crosses and your footwork and into your kicks and really perfecting how you add those. And well, now you're, you're really learning your body at this point. And you're really learning, where do you like exploring? What do you prefer to do? Where, where do you like to, what are your movement patterns? What movement patterns do you prefer? Why do you look at this move this way and this move another way? Why do you not like training this? Why do you think this is useless and this is useful? And by just going through this process, as a martial artist and as a human, you learn a lot about yourself. And I think we're always thinking, okay, how do we beat our opponents? How do I get on the mat and tap these guys out? What do I need to do to, you know tap out this guy on the mat or in the competition or how do I get to my next belt so I can tap out others or whatnot and I think and also just not only that but then how do I execute this movement on my opponent and that seems weird because like that isn't that the basis of martial arts like combative martial arts is how do I execute this movement on my opponent and I would say that um yeah, that's important and true. But at the same time, if you can make the movement natural within yourself, then no opponent will stop it. And that sounds crazy. It sounds like some woo-woo bullshit. It really does. But when you, you know, Miyamoto Musashi talks about this. He talks about how you must strike with your full resolve. And you must strike naturally. And what he means by that is you practice something to the point of it just happens. You you do it with your full conviction and 
and your resolve. And if you, in order to do that, there must be no other thoughts, just you and your movements. And you're not concerned with your opponents because what you do just happens. So if someone throws a cross at you, throws a right hand and you cross over his cross, which is actually why they call it a cross, and you're able to like intercept over that shot, well, you didn't do that because your opponent threw the cross. You did it because of your reaction to his cross. It started off with your reaction. So you have to perfect that reaction. You have to perfect that movement pattern. You need to be able to do that without an opponent. And the reason why that's important is because you have to know your vibe of doing it. You need to know your natural way of doing it. You can't follow someone else's. Now, when you first begin to learn a movement, you have to do it step by step and take your time. You have to learn the efficiencies of it, all this stuff, whatever blind spots you also have in the technique. You have to fix it up, you know, polish it a little bit, make it, you know, more useful than it is. And then you do the integration process and then it becomes muscle memory. And then now every time someone throws a cross, you cross over the cross. And that's because you layered it into you. So it first starts off, you know, blocky and robotic and shitty. And that's that's normal. And when you do your kihons and you do your katas, you're going to see the same thing. It's like, uh, step, punch, step, punch, block, step. And it's not one of this, like, fluid, like, block, step, punch. Right? It's not just this fluid movement that you just feel and you do. And I feel like we're so concerned about things being so realistic in martial arts that we kind of bypass the self-improvement part, the intrinsic motivational part, the perfecting your body only and learning how your body works as you throw punches and as you throw kicks and as you go into stances and as you move and glide across the mat and as you invert and as you do all these movements now, this is the same thing for, let's say, like a Budokan movement or Gimnastica Natural that like a Hickson used to do or like the Brazilians used to do. And uh, this is like kata but on the ground and is these animal movements or these inversions. And I would say that is kind of like the kata of the ground. You can almost say breakdancing is that way. You look at breakdancers and the way they move on the ground is just unbelievable um eddie bravo has uh geo and boogie right geo martinez and they were break dancers and they got their black belts in a couple of years and they became super high black super high level black belts very fast because they were able to understand their weight on the ground and that same thing applies to standing but we don't see it that way because we think punches kicks some semblance of a fighting stance, whatever style, because everyone sees things through a style lens. And, you know, yeah, so just punches and kicks and moving within their stance and blocking and all this stuff. But there's so much archetypal movements. There's so many movements that are common with all these striking arts and within all these traditional arts. And being able to glide through the mat just like how you would in these uh, ground katas, like in, in, in Budokan and stuff, or even like yoga. If you do that standing, you will become that much more proficient on your feet. And it's not a, again, it won't be about your opponent or having to defeat an opponent because it has nothing to do with extrinsic forces. And there is a time for extrinsic I hope I said that right, right? extrinsic motivational training. Like there is times to spar hard. There is times to game plan, right? To, to create strategy, right? To, uh, to learn how to move an opponent and create angles on your opponent to create wedges. That's all so important for grappling and for striking. It's, you know, I'm a huge fan of body to body striking drills, right? Where you have two opponent, uh, two people in front of each other and they practice their combos 
back and forth. Like one person's blocking the strikes and checking and then countering, and then the other person then has to block while the other person strikes, and you're kind of working these simulated drills. And I really believe that, you know, people don't almost don't do that enough. Um, I think there is a place for that, but today I'm speaking a lot about intrinsic motivational training because I'm going to go into, you know, this whole pandemic thing. A lot of us are stuck at home and we don't have an external force to keep us training. And to me, that's big because a lot of people that I know aren't training because they don't have an extrinsic force. They don't have someone on the mat with them. They don't have someone to yell at them or tell them what to do. They don't have someone to uh, to compare themselves against. That's huge because sometimes what pushes you forward is being jealous about another person being good. So then now you're upset and you want to fuck that person up. So then you train harder. And that to me is all great. It's part of human nature. That's what progresses you forward and you learn how to integrate that into your personality and that's what's important about martial arts and the competitive side and developing all that but at the same time right now since we don't have that for most people you got to find what drives you you got to find that thing that pushes you to self-improve to improve without a person and karate one thing they do is they learn how to build what's called kime. Kime means a snap, a a hitting with emotional con uh, emotional content to hit hit and imagine an opponent in front of you and use your full resolve to strike and efficiently, no energy displacing anywhere, straight like a piston, and that. That aspect of training karate I love because you don't need someone. You don't need someone to... I mean, it's, don't get me wrong. There's If you have a good coach and they're there yelling at you to, you know, you need kime, you know, like, like, and they're counting, like, each knee, right? And they're using their Japanese so it's even more intense and you have your gi on. And yes, that's good. But in your... What about in your room or in your garage where everything's dark and all you have is your fears and insecurities. Now that becomes what pushes you forward. It propels you forward. That fear, those places that you don't want to look in your training, like, man, my kicks aren't where they should be, or, you know, like, my shoulders come up when I punch in certain aspects, or maybe, you know, my stances aren't where they should be. I don't have the leg strength that I should have. Well, now this is the time to develop that and if you can develop it yourself without an external force man to me that means when there is someone in front of you you have this resolve that won't be faltered because you're not dependent on your opponent's reactions you're not dependent on your opponent you're dependent on your straight up ability your natural given ability to throw these strikes or to deal with scrambles on the ground if you like to do, let's say, like Budokan movements and stuff or uh, movement training. Which sucks that all this stuff got shitted on um, with Ido Bartal and everything, but man, if you can move your body and different ranges of motion and you can crawl on the ground every which way with no hesitation and and with fluidity and naturalness and not thinking just like how you would in a kata standing well then when you're doing jujitsu and when you're doing striking i mean not striking wrestling you're gonna move and glide a lot faster yes there's a gonna be a a learning curve of learning the moves but you're gonna have this you're going to have a non-fear of falling, first of all. You're going to have this ability to feel confident moving on your back, moving on your hands and feet, uh, hands and knees, moving from side to side on your hips, and being able to roll around and glide and learn how to get up on a post from elbow to hand and all that. You're going to be able to just be more confident in your movements and more, just more coordinated 
in many ways. You're going to understand what a good post is, not a good post is, as in like posting by host, holding yourself up with a post. Like let's say if you're doing a technical stand-up, you put a post on the ground so that you can, you know, stand back to your feet. And that's what I mean by posting. So you know exactly how far do I post, how close do I post. And you know this because you've been moving your body naturally. You've been moving. You've been learning how your body reacts to things. And if a show, how just your clavicle or your shoulder blade, sorry, your shoulder blade moves within, you know, your back. And does it ever protrude out because you're not tucking it in? So there's so many little factors. And to me, intrinsic motivational training, and I don't mean hitting a heavy bag. Heavy bag is not intrinsic motivational training. I don't care what anybody says. It's not because you're hearing the sound of the bag. You're imagining an opponent in front of you as you're hitting the bag, and you're hitting with full force, and you can pretend that's a person almost, and make it too much about the bag. And I see people do that all the time. Actually, a way I like to use the bag is, move the bag side to side and I'm striking where the bag just moved so I'm hitting the air and I'm learning how to move with the bag and see where I naturally find my spots and where I can you know just find myself moving and if a bag moves one way how would I move but I don't really like to use the bag as in just beating it up you can do that and that's more like sharpening your tools and having like a, a neural feedback, right? Having a having a feedback to like, okay, that was a good strike. I lined, you know, if I throw a cross, if I throw, if I throw a right hand at the bag without a glove, right? To see, can I really naturally just hit that bag good and hear a pop? And is my elbow and shoulder aligned and my wrist aligned? Do I feel strong? And then I throw my hip into it, you know? And that's how you sharpen your strikes with resistance by using a bag or a makiwara, and that's good too because you need to sharpen your tools so i'm not saying only do like kata and intrinsic motivational training but definitely add it and if you don't have a heavy bag perfect there's going to be more than enough time after all this to work on external motivational training right to work on beating up a training partner or competing or hitting a bag you're going to have time for that but for, ne- for right now, I would really invite you guys to look at how you move. And maybe look at karate kihons. I know it sounds ri- ridiculous, but maybe you guys don't even like karate. You don't care about karate and it has zero appeal to you. But look at the kihons. Look at the katas and see, can you move like that? Can you do that without any movements that's not meant to be there like a gymnast you know when a gymnast does their tumbles and boom they land there's no fixation right i think it's fixation or you want fixation i forgot which one it is but you want no movements you want just right there boom no energy out just perfect katas that they're meant that way too because you have to have this self self perfection um That's obviously more of a Japanese way of looking at it because the Okinawans used it for self-defense, but that's a whole other thing. There's many ways you can interpret kata and you can use kata. And for right now, I would definitely say just work on your body movements. And also, read a good book. Man, that sounds cliche as shit, but read a good martial art history book. It's going to make you think about technique. It's going to motivate you to train. Because when you learn certain historical facts, you start learning historical facts about moves. And you're like, man, that's interesting. I'm going to start going for Kimuras more. Or I'm going to start, you know, going for crosses more. Or maybe I'm going to start, you know, incorporating certain footwork. Because you saw that these masters did them. Or these historical, you know, old school fighters would use them. Or the history on how these things developed. It, It motivates you. And then you go to your garage or into your room and where it's quiet and then you just practice it. And then you learn, oh man, this is how I prefer to do things. I like this movement. I like that movement. This feels good. You know, and then, you know, maybe call up your coach and ask, hey man, I've been practicing this. Does your elbow move here when you do it? You know, does my shoulder 
when when you when you do you know a, a kisami suki right you throw a jab you, you do you throw more from your hip do you, does your elbow kind of like move inwards does when, when do you rotate your hands do how close should my feet come together how do you like to put your feet together how do you do you put your knees together or is there a slight bend where it's outwards at your knees or are they inwards man you can ask your coach so many questions during this time and you can really self-perfect and you can really develop your true just intuition and i would say that's really important just knowing yourself through training and then you could beat many many people and i would definitely invite you guys to do this and yeah so that's my little rant and i'm gonna do another one of these because i think there's a really important subject and it sucks a lot of people are not going to hear this i'm probably going to get like two views and one like but i think there's really something to this topic and i wish more people saw it more especially in the mma world where people are so focused on you know looking a certain way or being like another fighter or you know, like just listening to other people and and beating up on on people and what's you know will this work in the ring or not and just forget all that noise and focus on your natural abilities and movements. Focus on developing emotional con contact, emotional content in your movements. Without someone being on top of you or teaching you, you figure it out. You do it. You bring yourself to your highest ideal without the need of someone else doing it for you. Have self-realization. And it's not easy. And that's why people don't do this, actually. It's because it's not easy. It almost feels... It feels useless because... (laughs) it might feel useless because you feel like you're useless you might feel like you're not worth it you feel like man you're doing this so shitty and you and you probably are to be honest you're probably doing it shitty but that's when you start learning like man i'm shitty at everything i start at first and then that just becomes a natural thing to new things and then you're able to then deal with it because you know man you know i'm gonna look like an idiot at first i'm not gonna be good at it at first i'm gonna be mad at myself at first because that's natural because you want to get it down you know you probably have a little competitive side in you then you see other people do great you have a little bit of jealousy now (laughs) you know so you start to learn a lot about yourself so i would really invite you to just do it just just work on yourself and your movements and do your kihons, do your basics, do your katas, make it as robotic as possible at first so that you really get every detail, think about every detail, see where your holes are in your game, and then now integrate everything. And there goes on my topic of uh, intrinsic motivational training. Now, I'm going to talk something about a f- couple fight cards ago. Sean O'Malley fought. There's going to be a really weird opinion because um, it's not a common opinion and probably an opinion most people haven't heard or cared to hear or won't agree with. I think um, going back to this training of kata and developing yourself, one thing you develop really well um, in your katas and in your training, your karate training, is wide, strong, solid stances. And the, and the Japanese, when they when they brought in Okinawan karate into Japan, they made the stances longer and more dynamic and stronger. And I think what this did was it created. You know, that's why you see a wide stance. If you go to Okinawa and Karate, like like a traditional goju, they don't have wide stances. They didn't really develop their their legs like I would say Japanese do. Like, I I wouldn't say they develop the same footwork, the same explosivity. They, they They didn't do that. They developed more the hardness of their body 
and the in close range fighting. While in Japan it's more long range. And you need a wide stance to cover a lot of distance. And one thing Sean O'Malley does is he has a pretty wide stance. I talked about this in I think the last podcast. He has a pretty wide stance. But he doesn't have the motor behind the legs. And what do I mean by that is Jesse Enkamp, guys, he's a karate guy. Most of MMA guys won't really like his stuff, but it's really good. And one quote that he says, and I don't know where he got it from, was, you can't shoot a cannon out of a canoe. And what he means by that is when you punch, right, and you use all of your body weight to throw that punch, you need the legs to drive you there. You need a strong foundation. If not, it's going to topple over because you need your legs to move you within the cage to f- facilitate, wow, I struggle with that, to facilitate your footwork and to cover that distance. That's another reason why wrestlers do well in MMA is not just because of the ability to control where the fight goes, which is true, but they also have this sense of, they have these strong legs that can not only help them change levels really quickly, but they can cover distance. And they have a strong foundation underneath them with their legs. And I feel like that plays a big factor on why they have great cardio, why they can endure a lot. They can handle, most fight, most wrestlers can handle leg kicks, which is very odd, right? Like, how do they do that? It's because they have strong legs. And... To me, Sean O'Malley, this is his second time having an ankle issue, and I don't think it's from leg kicks. I don't think it has anything to do with a leg kick. Now, it doesn't help when you weaken the muscles down. Now, all you have are like ligaments or whatnot, but I think he hasn't developed his legs. And I don't mean by squatting, because when you fight, you don't squat. You move. You move in a stance. You move low. There's this kata called Seiyunchen in Goju. Seiyunchen. And this kata is all about moving within a low stance. Being in a horse stance, right? A shikodachi. In Shotokan, they do a kibadachi, which is like a horse stance, but the feet are parallel. Now, does this kata have like some sort of capabilities to help you learn how to fight i wouldn't say that but what it teaches you is how to move within a low stance and that really you know one of the ways we develop our legs and our punches is to punch in a horse stance and people don't do that they think it's junk training because they rather squat a million pounds and deadlift but that's not how you fight you fight in a stance you fight especially if you're like Sean O'Malley and you're more in a karate stance, you know, kind of like Connor. You have to have the leg endurance to be able to move within that range. And I think he doesn't do that because he doesn't have proper training for his style. They, He wants to do this hybrid karate style almost, but he doesn't have the leg strength to do it and I think that's what I think that's what messes him up and I think it's going to keep messing him up and yeah so that's one thing I would invite you guys to do would be get into a horse stance first of all can you do a horse stance without arching your butt back like flying out your back throw your hips in but still be low in a horse stance if you can do that now punch in that stance you know kick in that stance move within that stance move within that stance while punching at the same time do that for five five minute rounds see how you feel and if you can do that then in a fight your legs are going to be iron and you won't have fatigue in your legs this sport of mma is not boxing it's not we cover way more distance we wrestle we have to change uh, levels a lot more we have to deal with 
being able to sprawl on an opponent, being able to cover distance. I already said that, but it requires, that's a big one, covering distance, being able to move in and out without getting hit. I mean, you can't get hit. You just can't. You can't block with your gloves. You have to move. And it requires so much leg endurance, leg mobility, hip mobility, being able to move in and out, being able to grapple and not have your legs fatigue so you can strike more, being able to lock in a full in triangle and then be able to move the next round. It requires a lot of leg endurance, a lot of leg mobility, a lot of being able to hold your weight in like a more knee bent position. So that's one thing uh, I think if he added would help, but I don't think he will because it's very... People look past it. People look very past it. And I think it's unfortunate. I think people think that they're past old training methodologies. And I think that is uh, something that will be... Something that will be a detriment to the sport. Uh, One thing is there's a podcast with GSP and with Gordon Ryan. And... I might put a clip up here and talk about, you know, I'll, then I'll talk about it. Maybe I won't put the clip up. We'll see. Um, GSP talks about how he incorporate his distance management and his wrestling ability comes from karate. And I've talked about this a million times already. And it's like, I'm pretty sure you guys are so done with the topic. But I'm going to keep talking about it until you guys finally, you know, do it. And um, he's able, he says that a lot of his training comes from karate. I mean, a lot of his ability to move in and out and wrestle comes from karate. And yeah, so I'm going to put the clip up now. And if I didn't, well then, uh, you know, whatever. So I think, you know, GSP was known for not really getting hurt. And he was known for being able to come in and out. And people talk shit saying he was too much of a safe fighter or whatnot. But you know what? He never... He left on top. So, you want to be a badass or do you want to leave on top? With minimal damage. I'd rather be that person, to be honest. And I would invite everybody to look more at that realm of fighting. Instead of someone that gets a lot of knockouts and flashy knockouts. But once they're not the front runner, things go downhill. And there's not much to them after that. So yeah. Um, yeah, so sorry guys for the long break. I hope you guys enjoyed that Machida video. I'm going to come out with another one soon. And tell me what else you guys would like to hear. Anything you guys would like to see. Any videos. I have some, you know, stored up besides the Machida stuff. And um, you probably heard my intro. I'm going to have an outro. And yeah, guys, so I hope you have a great week, a great weekend, and I'll probably be back soon. Bye.